Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwal IV, Chief of the Little Republic of Akwemo Edumasa, and here I am today to bring you another wonderful guest. A face you may not know, a personality you may not have heard of, but these are people in their own way working hard in the background for the betterment of the black race and for Ghana. Dr. Lawyer Nana Opong is a biologist, is a physicist, is an economist, and a lawyer. To me, a philosopher. I have followed him for his writings, you know, writes very deeply. And today I want to bring him on board and find out what it is that keeps this fire burning in him. And also discuss his new write-up which says the law is one that protects corruption. The law is the one that guards corruption which then hinders developing countries. How's that? I thought the law was one that fought against corruption. We're here to hear. It's going to be like an academic conversation, if you may talk about it. But hey, don't go away. We are coming straight back. And my guest is Dr. Lawyer Nana Opong. It's going to be a wonderful one. Well, 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 thank you very much for staying. And this is the interesting bit. But before I get into it, let me say thank you to Crown Apartamento once again, right here in the heart of airport residential area, Sutton, the Serene Gardens. Uh, they always lend us their place to do our interviews. So I always recommend it to you. If you want a place to eat, place to rest, Crown Apartamento. But you see, with me, as I said in my intro, is a man that you may not know, but I say he's one of the thinkers of our time. On um, countless occasions, I have borrowed his publications, done TV shows with it, done radio shows with it, and, you know, taking a lot of credit, thinking that I was the wise one. No, I wasn't. I just borrowed somebody's wisdom. But then again, wisdom is there to be borrowed. So I'm here to talk to Dr. Nana Opong, a lawyer, biologist, physicist, and an economist. You may think he's 100 years old. No. Doc, <laughs> Doc, we've interacted so many times. Yes. And any time I try and get you because you've written something which I think is very deep and you know, I get very inquisitive with your writings. But personally, you know, I don't even know where you were born. Or I just want to find out the genesis, you know, what is sparking this fire in you? And you speak so eloquently, so somebody would think, you know, you're born in a brochure. <laughs> Uh, somebody would think you were born in a yeah. you know. So were you born in a No, I was born in Agona Ashanti. Right here. Ag yeah, Ashanti Agona Ashanti is a small town. It's now becoming a bigger town, but yeah, it was a small town. Schooled there? A little bit of schooling there, a little bit of schooling in Navrongo. And then I went to Canada. But I was born to a mother, an Ashanti mother, who's still alive okay. and who was very, very wise. And my childhood days was going through the rivers, the ponds, the forests, the trees, the mountains. And that has influenced me a lot. And I had an opportunity to play a lot as well. And so my childhood was wonderful. And then what I learned from all those things, life is a beautiful thing that ought to be preserved. I never had a sense of injury, of grievance, of distress when I was a child. And I think all the other kids around me had the same feeling in those days. Everything was beautiful. Television was not that much. No cell phones. It was just being a child, playing, seeing the universe, reality, parents, friends, an extended family. I grew up with a sense that we have a mission, that you're not here just to play or to eat, but everyone had a purpose. And so your purpose could be very little. It could be medium, it could be big, but everyone had a purpose. And from childhood, I was told I was brilliant and I didn't want to disappoint anyone. So I always performed in order to keep up the pace. So that's what happened. Uh, is, is mom educated? No, she's never been to school. Wow. But I think she's one of the smartest humans I've ever met. And I'm not saying it because she's my mom, mm -hmm. because of the interactions, the advice, conversations, education is given to me. So you don't have to be educated to be intelligent. Mm. You need education to be functional in terms of literacy and office and school and work. Mm -hmm. But intelligence, I think it's not a function of education, not in the formal sense anyway. Yeah. yeah. So from Aguna 
Ashanti, Aguna. You went to Navrongo. Yes. That's further up. Yeah. Did some schooling there. Yeah. What, what took you to Navrongo? They were saying that I would, quote, be spoiled if I was going to school in Kumasi. Because <laughs> my father had homes in Kumasi, and during the holidays I would go to Kumasi. And you wanted to be spoiled, so they took me very far off to a place which is very dry. The weather wasn't very friendly, harsh conditions, but brilliant students in competition. Okay. So I was forced to be, again, to be very competitive. I learned a lot at that school, and of course, I am shaped a lot by my experiences in the Upper East and the Upper West, country, I mean, regions of the country. And a part of me then is, even though I'm an Ashanti, because I also went to the North and so on and so forth, I am partly Northern. And then because I also grew up in Canada, I'm partly Canadian. So I'm a mix of Ashanti, the North, and Canada. A global citizen. That's right. Now in Accra. <laughs> so from so from Navrongo to Canada, or you stopped in Accra before? No, from Navrongo to Toronto. Wow. Yeah. What, what, what took you to Toronto? And why? Education again. Education. Yeah. So at, at what age did you go? Uh, very young. Oh. Yeah. I see. What, you remember what class? Like what year? What class? Uh, so let's say that's where I started all my university education. Oh, so you did uh, O level in Navrongo? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. up to O level you were in Ghana? Right. Oh, I see. I see. I see. So you did. Now I know you went to one of the best law schools in, uh, in Canada. Which yeah, Osgood Hall. Osgood Hall. It's actually the best law school in Canada. When my time was the best law school, and I think it still is. Mm. It has some of the top professors. And one of my professors in particular, uh, Professor Hogg, H-O-G-G, -G, he wrote the Constitutional Law of Canada, which was being used by the Supreme Court of Canada. And ultimately, he became also, I think, the dean of the law school. It's brilliant. And in, in those places, you wouldn't go into law school unless you were an A student. And on top of being an A student, then you have to pass the LSA, which is law school aptitude test. And on top of that, you have to compete against all these things. So, being a law student is very demanding, but it was worth it. So, I mean, how, so uh, at which point do you become, you know, a, a physicist, economist, a biologist? Yeah. So, and a philosopher. Yeah, and many more things. Many more things. I think when the brain is very active and you're not biased by anything, then any subject that you put your mind to, provided you spend time on it, you acquire knowledge in that field. I was very interested in many issues, for example, in physics, I was interested in the issue of space and time, which Einstein was trying to explain. He explained it. Of course, he created the formulas for E equals MC squared. And so, but I was interested in the issue of time, space, reality, and the origin of all things. So I invented the theory, or I created the theory of the microbitic theory of physics. So I'm the founder of that microbitic theory of physics, which says that everything that you see is one thing. And the one thing multiplied quantities, speed, and direction gives you everything that you see. So you and me, we are the same as the leaf, the same as the dead, the same as the living. It's just the arrangements. And then of course in biology, I was interested in how come when you eat dead things, that the dead things give you life and you become alive. And then I was able to figure out that dead things enter living things and they become alive again. Hence my theory that we can, in theory, resurrect the dead if we figure out a system that would allow the dead to be absorbed into the living, sort of like when you have a huge tank of boiling water and then you put, you put a bucket of cold water and instantly the cold water becomes hot. The reason is the overwhelming quantity of the temperature. It absorbs the cold to become the same thing. When the dead as a small percentage enter into the living as a huge percentage, i.e. one pound of meat enters into your body, it becomes alive again, and that's what gives you protein, your skin, your everything. So that's on the and economic side. When I came to Ghana, I figured out there was a problem with the economy and the way we we're thinking. We are fooling ourselves when we think that we're equal with the whites and the white economy and so on. But as a matter of fact, we have disabled economies. And I was asking myself, how come we don't talk about this disabled economies? And then the underlying problem was the assumptions and the serious problem of intellectual poverty. We have negative, injurious assumptions, and a lot of people are intellectually poor. So we need to solve these assumptions, intellectual poverty. And I came up with what we call niche mathics, the idea of the niche as the core 
of our economy. So for example, if you live in a small village, you have your niche. Mm -hmm. Town, you have your niche. You trade among yourselves. And ultimately, this nichematic economy, based on creativity, will take off. Do you understand that? Mm. And then, of course, many other fields. And in terms of law, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law and so on and so forth. I've written one of my books is called I Legal, How to Think Like a Lawyer. And I'm interested in systems, approaches, institutions, and so on. Wow, wow, wow. And you're also the president of... Uh, the Distinguished Scholars, Scholars of, Africa. of Africa. Yeah. What, 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 what brought about that? I met many brilliant professors who had contributed dramatically and significantly to Ghana, Africa, and so on. It's around the world. And then we figured out there's no place for the brilliant after they retire, or there's a place for brilliant even before they retire, where they can come and put their minds collectively, what I call the learned collaboration, in solving problems. So Distinguished Scholars of Africa was born. It is the premier organization for distinguished scholarship in Africa. And we do our best to explain reality to our people, to set our people free. As Jesus said in Isaiah, he quoted in Isaiah 61:1, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to set free the captives and so on and so forth. And to give advice where it's necessary. Part of the work that I do is because I am the president of the Distinguished Scholars of Africa, to set our people free intellectually, emotionally, politically, economically, scientifically, legally, and in every other way possible. And then you have this 21 brilliant thing in school. Right. It's called the Leonard Councils Program. And okay. it's an idea that brilliant students ought to be encouraged to learn how to be selfless, to learn how to be leaders, to learn how to be proper and moral. So we go to every high school that we can and we set up the Leonard Councils Program. So the students that we get are the brilliant ones. We want to work with the non-brilliant ones, but we start with the brilliant ones as well. And so what happened is the brilliant students form a club called the Leonard Councils, where they have an oath, they have rules, they live moral lives, selfless lives. They help other students to learn if they can't find the support and so on and so forth. So essentially, we're grooming future leaders through the Leonard Councils Program. And every student in that group has to be first. If you drop out of first, you get out of the club. And if you're in the club, it means you have not to serve yourself, but to serve the community. Hoping that future, in the future we have leaders gone through the program and they'll be moral, ethical, and very intelligent. Wow. <laughs> do, do you get time to practice law? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am a, a litigator. That means that I take cases that have litigation and then I am the leader of that. I am very interested in things of justice and of fairness and ethics and rules and so on. I don't like injustice at all. It's within my heart and soul not to sit around and let people cheat people. Whatever your status is, whether you're the boss, whether you are a king, whoever you are, the biggest king that I respect is God. Mm -hmm. Next is justice. Next is compassion. So God, justice, compassion. I live by that. So on that score, if I go to courts, or my life is all about that. I mean, I mean, last week, I was trying to get you last week, and you said you were the Supreme Court. Yes. Now, I couldn't say on the phone, but, you know, I said, so is he in the Ghana bar? Has he been called to the yeah, Ghana bar? Yeah, 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 I've been called to the Ghana You can't go to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> you want yeah, serious contempt? Know, right? <laughs> no, no, you have to be. I was called to the Ghana. I was called to the Ghana bar in 2008. Okay. Yeah. So I've been a lawyer since then, in Ghana for that okay. time. Yeah. Okay. 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 Wow. 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 But the thing about we have to understand this. We're used to thinking of lawyers and things as going to court. The law is bigger than courts. Mm -hmm. The court is only a small aspect of the law. The real law, I think 99% of the law, it's outside of the court and administration and offices and business and contracts and everything that we do, it's influenced by law. So we should think of lawyers as those involved in the rules and regulations that govern our lives right from childhood until death. Because even death is governed by laws and so on and so forth. And I like to be that lawyer outside of the court and inside of the court who's making a difference. Okay. Now, let, let me take you back to Navrongo. In, uh, in Navrongo, what was your dream? What did you want to become? It's funny enough, when people ask me what do you want to become, I said I want to be great. And as a child, I didn't know what great meant, but I knew it meant that I wasn't just going to be average. One of the things that I learned quickly on was that God never created average people. 
-hmm. that we make people average. Mm -hmm. Somebody tells you average, you believe it, and then you become average. So I want it to be great. And so my whole life has been, from my childhood, Navrongo days, has been to be above average. So I'm never satisfied with all the things that I've accomplished. I think I have much, much more to do, whether it's in writing books, in setting up organizations, helping people. But the whole point is, as long as you have life, you have responsibility to move forward and to do stuff for humanity. Million dollar question. Do you get disappointed that, because I mean, I read your work and it's very, very deep. Do you get frustrated when maybe people don't buy into what you have read or don't understand you? How do you deal with it? Yeah, most people, first of all, don't have access to my works. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, your show is an excellent opportunity for people to hear about me. Mm -hmm. And the people that get access to my works, many of them, are, they don't follow up, let's put it this way. <laughs> they don't follow up. Because one of the problems that I found is one of the books that I wrote was in Africa, in Ghana in particular, nothing moves the majority unless it involves money. Mm -hmm. So even intellectuals and professors and lecturers and so on, if you give them work and you're not getting any money from it, they will delay in reading and giving you feedback and they will even give you feedback because they're getting nothing from it. But if you were to pay them to come and give a follow up, commentary and so on, then they'll come. So money has taken the hearts and minds and souls of many of our people. And then of course the issues that I talk about are not bread and butter issues for many people, but they have an influence on bread and but because it doesn't have, it doesn't put money in your pocket, it's not relevant to them. But I'm encouraged by the fact that more and more people understand and appreciate and the second of all, I'm doing it for God and country. I'm not doing it to be praised, to be acknowledged and to be loved. When God loves me, that's sufficient. And we are coming straight back. You see, there's uh, not all the faces that you've seen before, but the things you're doing behind the scene will blow your mind. We're coming straight back. Don't go away. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for staying. Once again, thank you to Crown Apartimento. Uh, now, the last time I spoke to Doc was probably about four years ago. He had written a paper called Paper Nation. Well, he was saying that uh, Ghana was a nation on paper, but not in actuality. And when you read it, it made sense. So we made an interview about it. And guess what? He's come up with another one. The law as the helper of corruption and of underdevelopment of nation. The law as the helper of corruption and of underdevelopment of nations. So ironic because you think the law was one that was supposed to promote and propagate you know, these things. A doc is saying uh, it's the law that's doing that. <laughs> How is that even possible? No, that the law is the one that's supporting corruption and supporting underdevelopment. The law has to be divided into two sections. We have the law as seeker after truth. And we are talking law as in the legal law that we, that, that we abide by. Right, all the legal systems from parliament, court systems, governance, all that thing that we call law. Because everything that we do now from governance to judicial systems to administrative systems, they're all legal. Yeah. They're all based on the law. Yeah. So we have to divide the law into two sections. We have that function adjudication function which looks for truth at its best it finds the truth based on facts and logic that portion of the law is the smallest portion of the law that function of the law is the smallest portion then the large portion of the law now is it has to do with budgets and finance and allocation and projects and awards and contracts and so on mm -hmm. that's for now the greatest portion of the law because it has to do with the governance and I'm saying to you the legal system that's been set up has not been set up for the sake of truth, but it is set up for the sake of preferences and politics. That means it is no longer about truth, but it's about authority. And authority is about power. So whoever has power does right, whatever he does, because according to the law, the power that be, which means the greatest power, has finality as to what is law and what is not law, what is legal and is not legal, what is right is not right. So if the Supreme Court says, it is black. I'm not talking Ghana, every Supreme Court. 
If it says it is black and it is white, it is black because the Supreme Court says so. No appeal because it, has the court, it is the court of final appeal. But that's just one aspect of it. The law creates opportunities for access to resources and to wealth. And then it creates defenses and systems that justify these expenditures. And it creates appellate systems that at best may overturn a few of those decisions, but at worst justifies what's been done below. And if you put all the systems together, what we have now is illegal systems that creates corrupt opportunities, that empowers people to take advantage of those opportunities and gives them the defenses that make it impossible to find fault with what they've done legally. And there are three causes of underdevelopment in the world. The first one is conflict. Conflict causes underdevelopment, we all know that. Second one is incompetence. When you're incompetent, you can't develop. The third one is corruption. And corruption causes conflict and incompetence in the long run. So the worst of conflict and of incompetence is corruption. And once we have a corrupt system in place, foreigners don't need to come and control us because through corruption, we can never develop. Because corruption enables offices, authorities, people in power, people connected to take national resources, state resources, and to privatize it and to share it among themselves. And they can do it legally. If you're very smart, you have smart lawyers, and you are in authority. Nothing you do can be illegal. And I don't blame the people with power because who doesn't want to be rich? And if the law gives you the power to be rich, why blame them for being rich? So the law as it stands now has to be changed because if it's not changed, we will never develop. You see, in your write-up, you say that the law assumes everybody to be in good standing, God-fearing, and therefore they will go and do good. Yes. And so if the person doesn't do good, well, that's what the law assumed that he was going to do yeah. anyway. Yeah. So the law doesn't expect the judge to take bribe no. and set you free. No. But or to take a bribe and put you in. Uh, put, <laughs> put you in. But is that not what the law can do? What, I mean, what, what else can the law do other than assume you're going to be good? I, I see the law as we have now. It's 1.0, the version 1.0 of a version 1,000 points. So we haven't started anything else. Well, we have to ask the question, what else can the law do? For example, whenever we have entitlements, first of all, let's revisit the assumptions. Mm -hmm. Is everybody reasonable? The law presumes everybody should be reasonable. Mm -hmm. But we know in our society, for example, most people don't have education, they don't have legal training, they don't have the competence, the resources, and we know poverty, education, illness, all of that affects the ability to be reasonable, right? So let's deal with that. How do we deal with all these semi-illiterate poor people with problems? And how do they then access benefits, rights, entitlements, and the judicial system based on the incompetence and difficulties they have? We haven't dealt with that. Mm -hmm so-called legal aid and the three things are just little tweaks of a huge problem. So we have to deal with it. And the second one is, look, the law has to come down. We have to reduce discretion. A lot of corruption comes from discretion, whether it is administrative level, judicial level, political level, whatever the state is. When people have discretion, they can turn it corruptibly. Are you with me? Yeah. So let's reduce, let people have entitlements. Let people know their rights. Let there be more rights, more entitlement, and reduce the amount of discretion. For example, if somebody is supposed to make a decision whether I get a visa or not, it shouldn't be him sitting down thinking, I like you, I don't like you. It should be criteria. And if the person decides wrongly, the appeal system should be refined so it is automatic and simpler. Right now, if you have a problem, if a judge at the lower court rules against you, you have to file in the system and appeal money, delays, frustration, Let's look at all these issues. How can we have a better system which reduces discretion, which is corruptible, and then frustrations, which also leads to corruption, and third of all, so we can get justice. And finally, look, I think it's very simple. Let's look at each aspect of the law and see, is it corruptible or not? And if it is corruptible, how do we remove that corruptibility? And I have the formula which says C equals C. Mm -hmm. Contingency equals corruptibility. The more contingent the decision is, the more corruptible it is. The less contingent, the less corruptibility. Therefore, every decision that has a high amount or high degree of contingency might be corrupted and in fact will be corrupted at some point. So let's reduce contingency in decision making, focus more on entitlements 
And let's be honest with ourselves. The system is not working. Won't you be asking for an idealist situation in that case? No, no, not at all. For example, let's talk about our budgeting system and governance. Mm. You have a boss or a high official sitting down with a whole bunch of money and deciding on a formula which can be manipulated as to where the money should go. Mm -hmm. But what if we had a different system, opposite system, where we decide how much money each Ghanaian is entitled to out of the national resources, count the number of people within a locality, allocate funds for them, and let the district or local assembly decide what to do with that money. That will reduce corruption. Because the people will know how much they're getting. And the boss or the leader cannot take that money away. They will decide what to do with the money. And they will know what the money is coming for and how much it is, right? That's just one example of it. Let people have rights and entitlements. If somebody is coming to a locality to mine, to do mining, for example, let's reduce corruption by saying the locals have the right to object. And that objection automatically puts a stay on the project. And let the person come with the project go but to that, court. that is the law. No, that's not the law. If a minister or a person has a proper permit from a minister and he comes to do work, you have to go and challenge it. He doesn't have to do it. He can just assume that I have the permit to do the work. Why can't I do the work? You understand that? Mm -hmm. Let's reverse it. Let the burden be on the project manager, whoever is going to do the project, and let the citizens have the automatic right of an injunction against projects that they deem to be injurious to them. That's another way of doing it. Let us look at so many aspects of our... We haven't sat down to do that. We talk about constitutional reform. The constitution of the country, of any country, is so little of a document full of text that can be manipulated, interpreted by different people depending on your politics, knowledge, and so on and so forth. It is not sufficient guide, sufficient authority to be able to tell us exactly what to do in every situation in the country. And so, again, constitutions create contingencies. But again, you, you write that, you know, laws were written, most laws were written in history. Yes. Back in the days. And so the contest and the times with which it was written could, you know, be different and misinterpreted. Does Not even mean? misinterpreted, interpreted in a way that fulfills the objective of the interpreter. Mm -hmm. And in the context of politics, in the context of money and greed and insecurity, why not? And for every law, there's a counter law. For every proposition, there's a counter proposition. For every logic, there's a counter logic. You understand that? Yeah. So if you want to justify any decision at law, you can. You will find the precedents the principles, the distinguishing features, and all the things that would justify what you're doing. Any smart judge, smart administrator, minister, power that be, can justify any decision that he or she makes, or they make, as legal. So the legal is no longer a question of right or, or truth. It's a question of status. Who's making that decision? Is it made by the minister? Is it made by the Supreme Court? Is it made by the president? That determines the rightness of it. It's not whether it is just. It is not whether it is good. And that's where we've come now. So if we want the legal system to be just and equal, then we have to look at issues of entitlement. Maximize the entitlements of citizens. Let them know what they're getting. Let's have a formula. Let's have a management system that relies more on machines, tools, technologies to award contracts and projects rather than sitting down and looking at the human being whose mind influences, history, religion, spirituality, affection, emotion, you will never be able to determine. We have what I call performances. Life has become a theater. So the decision maker knows what he or she has to do. He or she has to do in order to make that decision legal. So it's like crossing T's and dotting I's. You can cross the T's and dot the I's and get any decision justified. I'm saying to you as a lawyer, mm -hmm. as a legal scholar, that Unless a person is dumb, any decision that you make can be justified as legal. And that's why you have in America, for example, everything the Democrats say, the Republicans say, oh, is this, is that. You can always justify contrary. And why? In the Supreme Court, you have dissenting opinions, right? Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. And in fact, in the same courts, in the US, for example, you had a completely 360 degree overturn of a previous decision by another panel. Why? The same law, same constitution. The spirit, the emotions, the personality, the politics of the judges, of the ministers, of the politicians affect the legality of the decision. But in law, wouldn't that always happen? I mean, even in the palace, as you mean, I came from a polygamous home and there's an issue of polygamy. I probably wouldn't have any problem with it. The next 
and Sakwa comes and is a Catholic from you know single home will probably see polygamy as an issue. So I mean, won't law always be interpreted based on the spirit of who is the head? That's why we have to reduce the amount of interpretation, the areas of discretion. Nobody has discretion when it comes to salaries. Once the salaries are fixed, for example, every month everybody collects a salary and whoever is in charge of the money can't do anything with it. Why? Because there are entitlements, right? Mm. Nobody has any problem. You have your entitlement as a Ghanaian to a passport. When you go, you get your passport because they're entitlements. So let's increase the number of areas where entitlements are clear and reduce the areas of discretion. That's all I'm saying. If you want to have good laws, reduce the amount of discretion. There will always be discretion, interpretation, and so on, but reduce it. And look, it's a conversation that we must start. We've had this old law, existing law. Is it adequate for 21st century, given digital people are moving and lots and lots of money? Changing hands in a few hands and controlling it and using the power of the state, the power of the law to justify what... Look, I don't see how it is possible for any politician to have access to power and not be corrupt. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Not because they're bad people, but because it is simply humanly impossible not to be corrupted by the money and the legality of doing what you're doing. If a politician has all the eyes dotted, the T's crossed, the lawyers have checked, they give him advice, why can't he do what he's doing? And if he does it and is legal, is it corrupt? So another way of corruption now is that if you define it as legal, it goes away. And a lot of corrupt things are being defined as legal. Before I go to the break, one question. I mean, were you the student in class that would always ask that question that a professor would think, oh my God, not him again? I was always the student that was in front of the class. <laughs> always the student in front of the class. I'm naturally inquisitive. And I don't take, I don't respect humans as God. I respect truth as truth. So if you tell me something, I want to know if it's true or not, or just because you're saying it. If you're just because you're saying it, I don't buy it. I know our lives on earth very short. We are here because God brought us. So we should live a life of truth rather than a life of idolatry. And idolatry is to worship humans, not to question them and to be afraid of them. Now there's a man who goes against the status quo. Stay tuned, we're coming straight back. Well, thank you very much for staying and it's been one beautiful, beautiful conversation. Uh, but before we go back into the issue of law, uh, God, did you have any siblings? Yeah, I have two sisters. Older? Yeah. You must be a pain. <laughs> <laughs> you must be that little brother who's a pain. Oh, you're a lovely little brother. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But now, now you're a cool brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you must be a cool That's brother. Right. But growing up, I'm sure uh, you're not the best li little no, brother. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Now, somewhere in the write-up, it says the law is a show. It says, no matter how good your case may be, you can't win by showing up and praying for a win. On the other hand, no matter how bad your case may be, you can win if you know how to play with a superior stagecraft. We make a big mistake when we think of the law as anti-corrupt by nature or by design. It is not. The law is a management system for social order. It is a continuum that can manage corruption as well as goodness. The law can be used against or for corruption, although the desire is to use the law to tackle corruption and for development is intuitive. Well-meaning and a universal practice. My thesis is that corruption is part and parcel of our modern legal culture. Corruption is not necessarily an aberration or something that bad people do against the law. Corruption is more often than not the result of self-enriching opportunities offered by existing legal system, exploited by those fortunate to be in control. In a world of competing strangers entitled to exploit one another legally. You can't just turn up at court and hope to win. You must know how to play the game. That's, that's... Exactly. Because the legal system is about rules and procedures and it's about precedence. And so if you don't go by the rules, you don't have the right procedures, you don't have the right precedence, the right 
representation, the right to lawyer, and so on and so forth. You may have the facts, but the facts alone do not give you the judgment that you need. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And apart from that, it is very, very important to understand the person of the judge matters a lot. Because the judge is not God, he's a human being. And therefore, a good human being will be a good judge. A bad human being will be a bad judge. An immoral human being will be an immoral judge. And he or she would apply and be seen to apply the law in a way that looks like they're doing the legal thing. But they could be completely wrong and immoral and unjust. That is why the types of person that we choose to become judges is very, very, very important. You see people fighting as to who's going to be the judge. And it's because the person matters. The person matters because the person will decide which precedent to call, which rules to cite, which procedures to apply, which argument to take, which evidence to accept, which evidence to reject, to deem relevant, irrelevant, extra, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to judicial decisions, the person of the judge is more important than the rules and regulations, although they're also important. But you can't just show up and say, well, I have a very good case. I'm going to win. No, it is not so. And number two, apart from the issue of going to court, you know court costs money and time and frustrations. That is only a small aspect of what the problem is. The most problem that we have is allocation of benefits and rights in this country and every other country. And when it comes to that, most of it is not subject to scrutiny because of what I've written before in my theory of Nonsensus consensus. <laughs> the whole idea is if something becomes so complicated that it becomes nonsensical, then people accept it because they have no way of challenging it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the law and the practice of law, administrative law, and political things that people do has reached the level of nonsensus consensus. We don't even understand it. If they bring a contract, an agreement, a project, a bidding, and so on, how many people can even read, let alone a challenge? So even if you have the so called right information, and you have that information, you can't understand it, you can't apply it. How useful will that information be? We need to step outside of the legal system we've inherited from the colonialists and ask ourselves, how do we manage our resources so that everybody will get some, according to the rule of equality, with less possibility of manipulation, of politicization, of discretion. And I think that's the management software system, technology that we haven't created that we need to start talking about, thinking about and creating outside of the system system of the law and then we can incorporate that into our laws but for now if you have power and you have smart lawyers nothing you do is illegal everything that you do including spending most of the money can be legal it is legal when the authorities say it is legal it's 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 amazing but uh, if you look at I mean, so where do you start from do you take the laws and stages and say, okay, we are going to now have a systematic thing put in place. So let's see, I don't know, because, because nature is so fluid. You know, I could be doing 100 because my wife was dying. You could be doing 100 because you were drunk. I mean, if we turn up in court and the judge just looks at it and says, no, everybody doing 100 has broken the law. So whether your wife was dying or whether you were drunk, you both sent to jail. How then do we go about it? Let's start with the easy cases. When you have a problem, you start with the easy ones that you can solve. Let's start with the money. <laughs> start with the money. Let's put courts. I said it's only a small percentage yeah. of the problem. The big problem is the money. Mm -hmm. People don't have schools. They don't have medicines. People are dying malpractice, injuries, roads, and so on. Let's start with that. That one, there's no debate about. There's money. Mm -hmm. So how do we allocate resources to make sure that people have food and people and so on? I think that one is easy. Mm -hmm. We can sit down with experts and develop a management system. That would say, for example, Ghana has 80 billion CDs or 20 billion dollars, mm -hmm. for example, for the 2020 coming year. How many people are in Ghana? Say 30 million. Divide that money. Calculate a fraction of it should be used for the local assembly. So the people in that locality, you are entitled to a certain percentage based upon the number of the people. Then let the people decide what to do with that money. That will reduce hunger, diseases, suffering, and frustration. Then we'll sit down with the judges. I said before, it's about the person. Do not appoint a person as a judge until they've reached a certain age, until they've shown a certain disposition in community service, in their lifestyle, and so on and so forth. I see a lot of the problems that we face are not in the courts. A lot of the problems that we face is a society that worships money and it pretends that money is not the problem. 
when you worship money and you adore those who have money, then why shouldn't everybody in position of power take money as the God? Idolatry now is not the worshipping of a small stone or so-called spirit. It is the worshipping of money. And that God of money is influencing everybody, with a few exceptions. So that when the person is a minister, a judge, a lawyer, a doctor, a politician, whoever, they are all influenced by the desire for money. Now let me tell you, one of, the, one of my books that I legal, I talk about three important Western laws that I've deduced from my years of reading legal philosophy in Western history. You have the right to be wise. That's the first law. You have the right to be foolish. That's the second law. And the wise have the right to exploit the foolish as long as they do so legally. That's the third law of the Western culture. So if somebody is wise, he has the right to exploit everybody else who is not wise or to work with those who are wise to exploit those who are not wise. So if he has power and money, why not? Why not use it? So the Western system, we know it has a problem, so we have to go outside of it. A management system taking into equality, justice, discretion, and corruptibility. Mm -hmm. That minimizes corruption in that respect. And make sure our judges, our judges are, are well-trained, well-motivated, and completely honored when they do the right things, and not honored when they do the wrong things. And then set up legal system which reduces delays and frustrations and money, because that is one of the ways by which corruption happens. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. When people have discretion, they can put you in jail. And then before you file an appeal or a review, it takes time, you're languishing. Why won't you go and see that person? Do you understand? So let's remove all, let's sit down. What, we've not sat down logically. We talk about constitutional amendment and so on. That is a small aspect of what we need to do. We need a complete overhaul, our management system. How do we manage ourselves as a people? our resources, our grievances, our disputes, and then sit down and create systems, logical, computerized, technologically sound, updatable systems that will make sure, taking into equality and justice and, and so on and so forth, that we have a better system than what we have. And what we have now is laughable, and it's not a very good recipe for development. And I even wonder why development partners, so donor partners come here, and they give a lot of money to a system that they know or ought to know it's so corruptible that most of the money for development will never go for development. Another chapter in your book which I find intriguing is, I alone, therefore, I am. That's right. Another way of saying the same thing is this. In the modern law, you are when you are different from everybody else. Yes. Everywhere you are when you are like such and such. Yes. In the modern law, you are when you are unlike another. That's right. You are when you stand alone, unique. This legal concept of the self as aloneness is increasingly being reinforced by technology. Right. And so in my, in other traditions, for example, let me use the African tradition, when they define, when they say, nana ansa kwao, it's, oh, he is the chief of a dumasa and he is the husband of and the son of, and you're connected. Identity in African culture, for example, is connectivity. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the modern legal system, identity is aloneness. You're not connected to anything and you are unique. In fact, technologies, iris, fingerprints and so on, all to ensure <laughs> that you are alone. So if I am alone and I've got the money and I can legally take it, why can't I take it? Why can't I pollute the water? What do I care? It's me and my wife and kids or me and my husband and so on and so forth. But if you have a system where you are connected to the village, which is connected to that river, which is connected to that tree, and so on and so forth, you think twice, because you are not I, you are we, you are they. And the consequence of that, in terms of corruption, is completely different. Those who think themselves as I, think different than those who think themselves as we. I think the evolution of man is we, and when a man insists as I, he has gone back, regression. In the same chapter, you, know, you, you, you worry about how Legally, you know, one person, even though a singular can be multiplied because uh, a company is a living thing. Yes. And he could be behind the company. He could own 25 companies. Yeah. And so he then becomes 25 people. And so at every given time, if those 25 companies are doing a transaction, you know, it could be him. And if it's illegal, so he could be doing 25 <laughs> illegal things. Yeah. At a go. I mean, uh, are you not getting... You know, too finicky, you know, 
picking. No, 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 let me explain something. You're talking about the concept of legal personality mm -hmm. and the law. Uh -huh. Before the law, modern law, there was no such thing as incorporation. Okay. And the whole idea of incorporation is instead of you being physically present to do business, you create a vehicle called a company, which is you can be limited or mm -hmm. not limited, but a limited liability company is all we know. And that company then has a face, it has identity, it can do business, it can be found liable, it can own properties and so on. So before that incorporation thing, if you want to do business in Brazil, for example, you have to physically go to Brazil or hire a person to go to Brazil. But now with the corporation, you don't have to do that. So a criminal, a corrupt person, can use the incorporation to duplicate, to multiply his or her presence or their entities so many times and therefore multiply the mischief. And it only happens because the law allows you to do so. Through the concept of trust, for example, by the way, we say is a living, sorry, is a person, legal person, not a living person, the company. Mm -hmm. Through the trust principles of law, a person can get another person to register as the legal title owner of a property. So you have a property which is this phone, I can buy a trust agreement, register as the owner of the phone, as title owner of the phone, and then you'll be the beneficiary of the phone. Through this trust arrangement, if somebody goes to do a search looking for the owner of the phone, my name will appear, your name will not appear. What happens? You can use that system for good, or you can use it to defeat your creditors, and so on and so forth, and to hide from taxes and blah, blah, blah. And so many other concepts of the modern law which is supposed to facilitate facilitate crimes and but without those things the possibility of duplication of cells will not happen so you can see how the law in intending to facilitate trade facilitates crimes as well there are always going to be bad people so i mean are we going to s the law is set up assuming we're all good are you saying we should set up the law assuming we're all bad yeah we all bad. It's in the <laughs> scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. so we should set up the laws if we all bad. Yeah. So it checks. That's right. And we should no longer depend on, listen to me, let's reduce the amount of discretion. It is discretion that causes corruption. Mm -hmm. I repeat, wherever there's discretion, there's corruptibility. And the more discretion there is, the more corruptibility there is. So if we all bad, okay, how do we make sure the one or a few people, one person or a few people do not amass our wealth, divert our resources, misapply our resources, get shoddy projects approved, get the auditors bought, get the inspectors bought, get everybody online. So a few people take the resource. How do we do that? We can ask that question and answer it logically. And then we say, how do we set up a system practically to ensure that we prevent corruption? We're not doing that now. You have so many people saying anti-corruption this, anti-corruption that, and all they talk about is character. I'm saying to you today, character is irrelevant. The thief can be stopped, not because of he's a good guy, but because he can't get in. <laughs> let's block the thieves from getting in. And once he's in, let's block it from getting out. And that's the system that we set up to prevent corruption, prevent expenditures once they occur. Now, now uh, this one here is under chapter four, legal rationality. Yes. I read one paragraph, which uh, I'd say, why not? And it says, uh, the fourth law is that every man has the right to make as much money as his skills and opportunity provide. As long as, he's, as, long as he, he applies with existing laws in doing so, getting rich through one's intelligence or job is not only legal, it's a right. The fifth law is that no product, service, arrangement or relationship is illegal unless it is so stated in a clear code of law. Does anything not clearly prohibited in law books is legal to do. Yeah. And so if you're very smart, what you look for are things that are prohibited. So that, for example, you have the doping, where certain chemicals are named as banned substances. But why are they banned? Because of the effect. But they don't ban the effect, they ban the substances. So mm -hmm. if you can create alternative products unknown to the law that have the same effect, you're contradicting it, but it's not illegal. And so what smart people try to do is figure out what is banned so they can go beyond it. The evolution of corruption is the ability to comply with the law while flouting the law. So that when somebody comes and says, well, you're doing something bad, it's aware in the book does it say it's bad, what have I done? Smart people are always at smarting the law because the law once it's written, 
it's coded, it's fixed, it's public, it can be known. So if we're going by text, which can be interpreted different ways, which have to deal with words and substances that can be updated, we have a problem. I remember many years ago, there was a hacker in the UK who hacked into the US system and took some information. And so the US was charging him for theft. And his lawyer in the UK was saying, for him to steal, he has to be present at a location at a certain time to steal the thing. And the guy has never been to the USA. So how then can he be charged for theft? I mean, is there no space in the law to say, hold oh, on, come on, technology has come and therefore, you know, this should be it. But it was a big debate that his lawyer says, look, my client has never been to the U USA before, so he couldn't have stolen from you. I would even use even a simple argument, which I think is stronger, which is that when your door is open, it's, it's a technological door which is open by virtue of its vulnerabilities and he's able to open it, which means you've given him the key. Then once he's in, he has a right to take whatever he can access. Squatter's right. And where was it said that don't take anything inside here? <laughs> <laughs> there was no such information. So please, next time just close your door, make sure he doesn't have the key and once he goes in. So he, he was... The argument of physical presence, I think it's a weak one, but mm -hmm. the argument that it was open to him and then he went in and as a curious person, he took whatever he could find, I think it's a stronger argument. But the point is well taken. Look, we have to be smarter to understand everything is updatable, it's evolving, and human beings will always outsmart what is written in the law books. We mm -hmm. cannot be frozen. We have to always think about bad people around, how do we make sure especially when it comes to the money. I'm interested in the money because the children, the sick, the poor, the disabled, they have been cheated out of their rights. Doc, this brings me to my question because, you see, the very people who uh, have the power to change the laws are the main benefiters. And so it becomes very hard for me to sit down in front of all this power and money and sign and say, yeah, henceforth, I don't want to have access to this power. I don't want to have access to this money. You've just proved my point. Just, that's what I've been saying all the time. It's, not, it's so unnatural not to be rich when you become a politician, especially in Africa where everything is insecure. Nothing is secure here. <laughs> Today you have money, tomorrow you have money, diseases, war, blah, blah, blah. So why shouldn't the politician for four years or eight years amass wealth for the rest of his life? So yeah. But let me, you continue. So are, are we in a catch-22 where we are stuck in a vicious no, cycle? No, when the people who elect the politicians say to them, we want the following rights. For example, I talked about the budget, mm. that we should have our share yeah. brought to us. If there's unanimity or the majority, it'll happen. When the people come together and they say, we want you to reduce the time for appeals. We want you to reduce the discretion in this area. Suppose they properly advise, it will come together. And, and, and. So the people need pro programs like this to educate them. And then you need experts to sit down and help the people. The people must run the system. Right now, the system is not run by the people. It's being run by a few fortunate Ghanaians and Africans who I don't blame them at all. They enjoy the benefits of getting to the top. And why not? So I don't see corruption as a problem of character. I see it as a problem of systems. Corruption as a problem of systems. You see why I got doctor on the show? Maybe I have to get him more often. Uh, it's, it's intriguing and uh, it's an eye opener. And I'm sure there's a big debate that's going on in the homes today. And don't forget that this show will be repeated on a Sunday at 2 p.m. So Sunday at 2 p.m. it will be repeated. How, while you have your lunch, sit down and watch Doc. I want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to you at home, we'll catch you next week.